We are Dan and Ben from Bishop Fox. Uh, we are penetration testers. Uh, we spend most of our days breaking into things like web applications, networks, occasionally cooler things like safes. Um, and uh, like you, we've been hearing a whole lot about this AI business lately. Yeah, I'm sure you've heard in the news. Uh, seems like every week there's a new article in the news about how you know AI is going to start driving our trucks and cars on the roads. It's going to start you know flying our drones, and uh, it's going to basically take all of our jobs. Um, so as pen testers, we were interested in how we could use this uh, technology and this these tools uh, to maybe do some offensive security stuff. Uh, we've heard a lot about defensive security applications for machine learning. Uh, there's things like firewalls out there that can do uh, anomalous traffic detection and those kinds of things. Um, but there weren't too many uh, offensive tools, and so we really wanted to explore that space. And uh, this talk is basically going to be about the intersection between uh, AI programming and uh, hacking. So, Yeah, so to give you a concrete example of this, um, we built a tool called DeepHack uh, that breaks into the uh, backend database of a web application using nothing but machine learning. So the the scenario here, just in order to better understand what you're about to see, is an attacker uh, taking uh, an attack over the internet, um, though they're this uh, a bank website, just say, that has a backend SQL uh, database that has a uh, what's called a Boolean-based blind SQL injection. So just in case you're not familiar with how that works, it's something like uh, being able to ask uh, 20 questions with a backend database. So you can do something like ask, hey, is uh, like the user's first name starting with an F? And it'll say no. And it's like, do you, does it start with a D? And you say, no. Uh, you, you ask the question, does it start with a B? And you say, yes, okay. And so you can enumerate the entire database um, based off of this sort of thing. And there are tools that do this sort of thing, um, but uh, none quite like how we did it. So um, in the demo you're about to see, um, this is all just taking place on one computer, my laptop, um, but uh, you know, uh, importantly here, um, the tool doesn't have any, say, insider information about the backend database, um, nor does it have any runtime information about like, the web server itself. Right, it's taking the perspective of an attacker on the public internet. This is uh, just one of mm -hmm. us, you know. Yeah, completely black box. So, demo. So, um, what you're seeing um, right here, I'm gonna just pause this for a moment here, is this sweet visualization, hopefully you can read some of the text um, that we made, um, that has on the bottom uh, part are the requests that are being made out to the remote server. Um, so you can see that it's um, querying the database character by character, um, asking for information from it. Mm. And up on the top there are, are like the discovered strings, basically. That's the information that it's received out from uh, the remote in, uh, endpoint. And you can see um, in a couple of cases uh, there, it starts to kind of freak out a little bit, and that's not what you would expect it to be doing. We're actually going to come back to that a little bit um, and explain exactly why the, the tool kind of doesn't always work exactly how you'd expect it to. Um, and it can uh, continue on this process, brute forcing character uh, by character, um, stealing information out of the database until it has basically the entire thing. Mm -hmm. So the, the couple of like important pieces here is that um, our uh, tool um, was never like programmed by us. Like we never programmed DPAC. Mm -hmm. It learned how to do all of this. And that's gonna be pretty important going forward, both for pen testing like uh, tools um, and hackers in general. Yeah, if you look through the code base, uh, there is no SQL string that you know says select count from table. Uh, yeah. There is no hard-coded SQL logic. Uh, it's all just using uh, artificial intelligence to kind of uh, understand how that works. <clears throat> yeah, so we might say it has uh, no tricks up our sleeve. Um, so uh, we'll be releasing the source code to all of this stuff um, immediately following the conference, and you'll be able to see for yourself that it's about like 200 lines of Python. It's not some massive piece of uh, new technology that had like never been discovered before. We don't have any major breakthroughs in machine learning. Um, this is basically taking existing machine learning uh, methodology um, and state of art and applying it to the world of hacking. Um, so, uh, yeah, notably, uh, like Ben said, there aren't anything like any SQL strings, there aren't any SQL structures, um, any information about web applications or databases at all inside of the, uh, uh, the underlying source code thing that actually is running this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the entire concept of brute forcing things character by character, the entire concept of what databases are and information behind that are all things that the machine has to learn. It has to discover that on its own. 
<clears throat> um, and importantly, uh, also along the lines of uh, no tricks up our sleeve here, is that this might seem sort of magical to you at this point, um, and that's almost on purpose. Imagine this whole presentation like a magic trick where we reveal how we did it at the end, um, where this might seem kind of special and scary to you. If it's magic, then it's black magic, which is to say it's the kind that hacks into stuff. Um, but I think by the end of this, hopefully you'll find that not only is this quite approachable, but in fact, in terms of machine learning, rather pedestrian. If there are any um, data scientists um, in the audience, um, I think they might find themselves uh, uh, like they could have done that themselves. And hopefully that's, yeah. in fact, what you come uh, taking away from this. Yeah, so uh, our, our program differs a little bit from a regular program in a couple of really important ways. Um, in a regular program, uh, you write some source code which is just going to be, you know, in English, and uh, you're going to basically be compiling it down to a binary, which is, you know, machine instructions. It's the thing your computer is actually going to run, and uh, those machine instructions are going to perform an action uh, based on what you programmed into it. And uh, there's a relationship between uh, the source code and the action you eventually take. Uh, there's kind of this one-to-one -one mapping. So uh, if you have enough time, you can sit there and reverse engineer any action your program has taken back to a line of source code. Uh, there is, uh, it's a very, very deterministic path back to, uh, you know, what actually decided on that action. Um, an AI program differs slightly um, in that uh, there is still binary and there's still program that's being written, but it takes in data and uh, runs it through uh, what's called a model, and uh, the model is what kind of decides an action. So you're not going to be uh, programming, you know, conditional logic in there, you know, if, if we're in state A, then we're going to take action A, else we're going to take action B, right? There, uh, there isn't so much of that, and the model will actually uh, decide an action based on, you know, probability and, uh, and, and just uh, what data it has seen in the past. And that's kind of where the learning kicks in. Uh, it can use this data that you supply it with uh, to kind of learn what has happened in the past and uh, decide what actions it's going to take in the future. So there's not, not, it's not necessarily as deterministic as a regular program. It can be kind of difficult to, to actually ask, oh, well, why did this you know, uh, program make the decision it did? Why did it decide to you know, select star? Or why did it decide to drop my database instead of you know, inject and, and steal all the data from it? Um, it's one of the fundamental differences. Yeah. Yeah, so we're going to be talking quite a bit about the model going forward, and that's uh, an important piece to take away here. That that's the thing that does all the smarts in your program as opposed to the code that you actually write. Um, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, so, so I, when I w was uh, learning how to do this stuff, um, I'm, I, I know a little bit of math, but I'm not, you know, a heavy, heavy math background, so I kind of, kind of had to take a different mindset to, um, to the programming, and I kind of consider it a different paradigm. You kind of have to formulate your problem a little bit differently, kind of uh, how functional programming is a little bit different than uh, object-oriented programming or imperative uh, programming. There's, it's kind of like a different paradigm. You definitely have to think about it slightly differently. Um. So uh, I described uh, machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence as a magic trick earlier, and if it's magic, then let's try to demystify that a little bit um, by learning a little bit how this works. Um, then uh, maybe you won't be quite so scared of it once you discover um, exactly how this works. There was this fantastic cartoon I wish I could have put on here, but the text was too small to read. Where like the Scooby Doo gang go and just like pull the mon the the, uh, the wig off of uh, some sort of a monster. That's like, oh no, machine learning, and it pulls the mask off. It's like, stochastic gradient descent. It was you all along. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, something along those lines. I, I definitely get a universal sense of fear from people that I talk to this about, even my own mother. Um, where I, I described, uh, she knows I do a bunch of like research projects and things like that, and not all that long ago she was asking me, like, what are the, th you know, what are you working on these days? And I said, oh, you know, making this like AI program that learns to hack into a computer, and she just goes, oh no. <laughs> like, that's, why would you do that? That's, <laughs> that's how it starts. Like, for whatever it is, I don't even know. Um, yeah. So if, if you um, and Elon Musk are uh, concerned about the same sorts of things, then you know, just, just keep watching, don't worry about it. Um, so yeah, machine learning. Uh, so suppose we want to solve a much simpler problem. We want to solve this maze right here. We want to make a robot that can go up and over and solve the maze and not fall into the lava or, depending on how you look at it, um, angry red birds. Um, 
They're lava birds, really. Yes, yeah, a lot, lot of birds, so it would hurt. Yeah. So behold the table. This is the most simple uh, machine learning uh, algorithm possible. Um, basically, you just have your robot take actions and record the reward that it gets. So for instance, it might uh, take uh, a step uh, starting at the, the starting position here, take a step left, fall into the lava and go, damn, that's minus 50 points, where I don't know, it just arbitrarily knows that 50 points is what you get for falling into lava. Um, and then it knows to not try that again, or at least it knows to try to explore some other state. So it might then try moving upward and get minus one and say, hey, that was a little bit better. And so now that it's in the next square, it can go try you know, turning right, fall into the lava again, god damn it, gets another minus 50 points. Um, and then basically just continue on this entire process, exploring things that it hasn't explored before until it's found its way to the start and it can derive the optimal solution. And this is basically it, this is machine learning. Uh, you, ba you just keep on trying things, you record what you found until you, you know, find a good way to the exit. Um, there's only one problem with this. Yeah, the problem is uh, when you want to do something that's a little more complicated, uh, for example, maybe we'll, instead of solving a maze, we'll play a game of chess. Uh, the problem is chess is a little more complicated than our maze and it holds quite a bit more state. Um, as you can see, there's about 10 to the 47 states in a game of chess. And uh, there's only 16 pieces, or you know, 16 pieces on each side. So uh, there's going to be uh, a lot of data to fit into our table. It's going to be very difficult, uh, pretty much impossible to, you know, create a table, enumerate every single possible state, and uh, decide what the best course of action is going to be. So uh, one of the one of the key points we're going to try to do is, or the key things we're going to try to do is, uh, we're going to try to scale down uh, the idea. We're still going to keep the idea of choosing random actions figuring out uh, if it was good or bad and kind of recording that, but we're going to want to scale it down so we can, uh, you know, explore state without having to store the entire, you know, game in our, uh, in our computer at the same time. Yeah, we have pretty beefy computers, but it can't hold all that. Um, so the main uh, uh, breakthrough here, the main uh, idea behind, like, actual machine learning as it happens, like, in, you know, any normal sense, is that this, this table, is basically just one of these, which is to say a function, uh, a mathematical function, the sort that take numbers in and produce numbers out in a predictable way. And so what can we do with functions? We can approximate them. And so uh, the, we have a, a following great little um, explanation of, like, kind of how um, function approximation works without getting into some of the more nitty-gritty details. I suspect some data scientists that are in the room might be groaning um, to themselves. But actually, by the way, uh, data scientists is sort of like what the AI community has decided to call themselves. It's a really terrible name. Uh, but, like, they're neither scientists nor have anything to do with data, really. Like, if anything, they're data engineers. Like, come on, let's be straight. Yeah. And if anything, it's like, it should be like AI engineers. Get your shit together, AI researchers. <laughs> Um, so this is usually in the point of these sorts of conversations where things get really mathy, and mathematicians break out scary language like linear regression and convolutional transposition that scare away all the norms. Um, but you don't actually need to know any of this. Uh, the frameworks are actually really helpful today where you can write an AI program without knowing a lick of like any of this, um, which is the way the rest of computers work. You don't actually need to know anything of like Shannon entropy to write a goddamn Python program, right? Like that's, like you can use a crypto library without knowing any of about RSA. And so the same is true just finally, like recently uh, within AI frameworks. Um, that's kind of why this has been taking off because it's no longer something that MIT does in their like for spare time. This is something that you actually can do today in a reasonably short amount of time. Yeah, so, uh, so function approximation. Uh, basically, we're going to be trying to guess what the function uh, that drew this line on this graph is going to be. So uh, the easiest way to start with that is to draw the worst function approximation possible, which is just a straight line. Uh, this essentially represents uh, your first sample. You have one data point. You're going to take one action. This is the first one. It's obviously going to be pretty terrible. Um, but the great thing is uh, you're basically going to just uh, take another sample and you're going to take another sample and each time you're going to plot you know, your data on your graph and uh, you're just going to keep on sampling until you kind of start getting close to your function. Um, it's really hard to get perfect, especially when you're in the real world and you know, you're trying to model something that's really complex, uh, but you can get really close. 
And this idea of uh, taking a random action or taking a, you know, a, a smart action and uh, seeing what happens, plotting it on your graph, and uh, just repeating this process of sampling over and over again is, is kind of the fundamental uh, thing you're going to be doing when you're building your AI program. And more fundamentally, this is almost the very definition of learning, isn't it? What right. you're doing is you're taking in information you're changing your model of the world on the basis of it, and then changing your behavior based off of the th new things that you've seen, mm -hmm. iteratively getting closer and closer towards the behavior that you'd like. Like, I just described the learning in a nutshell, right? This is just a mathem mathematical uh, way of representing that concept of learning. So however we try to do um, AI and machine learning in the future, it probably will take some form of function approximation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, there's kind of three things you want to think about uh, when you start saying, well, okay, well, how do I, you know, approximating functions, it sounds kind of complicated. How do I actually start, you know, writing code? How do I start getting, you know, getting into this? Uh, you want to think about three things for your program. Uh, there's basically your input, uh, which is going to be your environment. Uh, it's essentially everything your AI program knows about the world. Um, so, you know, for, uh, I'm going to go into the next slide, uh, we're going to talk about chess a little bit. Uh, it's going to be, you know, everything your AI program knows and it's the only thing it really sees. So, um, you're going to want to try to formulate your inputs uh, to, you know, uh, not present too much data but also just present enough of the world to be able to make smart decisions about it. Um, you're also going to have a reward, so when you take an action, it's either going to uh, do something good, do something bad, or maybe do something kind of good or bad, uh, depending on, you know, what your problem is. Um, and then you're going to have your output, and that's going to be essentially what action you're going to take. Um, so if you want to go then, uh, yeah, uh, so, you know, if we're going to have a real concrete example here for our, our game of chess, uh, our input would be, you know, the piece positions of all the pieces on the board. So, um, you know, you could put those in an array and just kind of uh, just have the, be the entire state of the, you know, the, the program. Um, your rewards are going to be, you know, if you move a piece, uh, what, uh, what happened, right? If you take a piece, you're going to be gaining some reward, you're going to get that carrot, right? The reward is, you know, your carrot on a stick, carrot or stick. Um, so if you capture a piece, you're going to be getting some reward, and if you lose a piece, you're going to be uh, gaining some negative reward, or losing some negative reward. And uh, if you move, perhaps, without actually taking a piece, uh, it might be just a slight negative reward, because you didn't really accomplish anything, but uh, you also didn't lose anything uh, too great either, just some time. And then, uh, like I said, your output is essentially going to be the action uh, which, that you're going to take for uh, your game. So. Uh, yeah, uh, and that's really about it. If you're wondering in the audience right now, or at home, Gerbin, uh, if you uh, can uh, try to make some sort of a program that can, uh, you know, take advantage of machine learning, try to think about it in terms of these three things. But um, input, which is say, what are the things that my program needs to see in the universe? Output, what are the actions that it should be taking? And then rewards, how does it know um, when, it got, when it did something good, or how does it know when it did something bad? Um, if you can think of your problem effectively in terms of those three things, then you can make a machine learning program that will solve your problem. Um, so getting back to our example, getting back to uh, Deepak specifically, um, it works a little bit like this. Um, this might seem at first like uh, an unintuitive way of formulating the problem, but it's actually pretty standard construction in terms of text generation. So the input here to the system is an incomplete query string. It's a partial string of text that it's generating. Um, and the output, the thing that it needs to decide, the thing that it wants to figure out, is what is the next character in this sequence. So if you're looking at our example here, it says select star fro, and then even in the audience here, you could probably think, well, M makes sense, right? If we're talk especially if we're talking about SQL, then it should be select star from. And then what you do is you take that M, you stick it onto the end of the query string, and then you just repeat this process iteratively. Um, and in terms of rewards, how does it know like whether it did something right or whether it did something wrong is again based off of the output from the remote server. So all we have information about are the Boolean based uh, uh, responses from the web server. So did this give us a 200 or did it give us a 500? Um, which is to say like, is that data correct or is it incorrect? I and mean, so entirely from that basis, we can figure out um, whether the string is uh, you know, present in the database or not, or whether this is something that we want or whether it isn't. Um, so as a good tangible example of this, um, there's, uh, you can imagine like we do this in uh, English all the time. In fact, you do this in your cell phone all the time, and so we're going to play a little game here. I want you to bust out with your cell phones right now and open up your text message app. 
because your cell phones do this currently right now um, pretty well. So you're gonna open up a text message app, whatever that happens to be, probably Signal, because we're hackers, right? You're gonna go to somebody that you really like, or maybe you really hate, and just type something in. Say like, I'm at DEF CON space, and then it's gonna give you a series of recommendations, which is your like machine learning assistant in your phone telling you what it thinks should come next. Just go ahead and press one of the buttons. Pick left, middle, or right, right? And then just keep on pressing the button, and then just keep on pressing the button. And you'll notice that it starts to generate some pretty hilarious strings. Oh yeah, my phone is going awesome. I'm gonna read you this in just a moment. And the trick here is you have to press send. That's part of the rules of the game. You agreed to it. Yeah. I'm pressing send. I've got, I'm at DEF CON. This is the first time, which is not, I have been every right to be mad at me for not being able for, to that day for last weekend and with Dan, this is getting serious, and wanted to see if I could get a copy of the receipt for that. It was a weird night in Vegas last night, apparently. <laughs> I'm married. For, <laughs> well, I'll get back to you on that. Your receipts. And I'm hitting send. So this is basically um, like what DeepHack is doing, right? So it's taking uh, the information from the string it has seen before, as well as in your cell phone case, um, the like what has the, been the history of things you've sent in the past, and tries to figure out a good suggestion for that. Um, and then that's really all there is to it. So you can imagine here if we have a sentence like a lot of foo, then the machine will try to create a good suggestion for you know, what letter should come next. Some good examples might be D, like a lot of food, or maybe a lot of foot, maybe there's a lot of football you've been watching or something like that, or maybe even foosball. And so strictly speaking, um, the machine doesn't pick the next character. Um, actually what it does is produce a, a probability distribution across all letters, and so it might give D a very high probability, um, T a very low probability. And so the entire nature of the program is probabilistic. And that, that leads us to why um, Deepak um, sometimes wigs out and does stupid shit. Um, because if you start out your sentence in the text message game um, with something nonsensical, or if you just kind of like pick something random, uh, then it goes off the rails quickly. So if the very first like couple of words um, have nothing to do with SQL and just starts talking about like food, then the deep hack has no idea how to recover from that and basically just shits the bed. Yeah. So. Uh some of the things to keep in mind, some of the uh, things we uh, ran into when we were trying to write our program uh, were uh, having good data is really key. Um, you want to have good labeled data to uh, feed into your model to uh, have a good basis. Um, like Dan was saying, you could pretty much uh, throw Deepak at a, a web server with uh, no training and it would just barf all over the place. It would be really good at generating random text and eventually you might run into some SQL queries, you know, like maybe some simple ones and one equals one or whatever that would actually work and it would be, you know, a, a light bulb would go off in it. But that would take a really long time and uh, we don't have a lot of time on, you know, engagements. So uh, you want to basically train your model. Uh, with uh, labeled data that you've collected over time, uh, so your you know model can you know learn a little bit about the problem you're trying to solve before you just unleash it onto the world. So uh, that's what uh, bootstrapping your model with experiences is. That's that's kind of what it's called. Uh, you're going to give your uh, model some experiences um, and try to you know teach it, kind of like a small child, perhaps. You're going to yeah. Um, yeah, making a machine learning program is a bit like having a child and teaching it to solve your problem instead of you having to do it yourself. Um, it can be a rather frustrating experience and get messy at times. Yeah, you have um, this indirect control over, you know, your program. Like, could you please maybe do that? I, that would be really great if you could, you know, start yes. hacking. That'd be great. Yeah, so it turns out that um, computers don't necessarily have to be um, taking action themselves in order to learn from it, right? You can give it experiences from, you know, other machines or things that it had seen in the past mm -hmm. to try to get it um, bootstrapped into better behavior. Like Ben had said, um, if you just start Deepak from scratch, it just produces garbage. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't do much of anything else. And if you give it an infinite amount of time, it'll eventually come up with a good SQL string. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not really good enough, right? Um, so um, uh, the getting a good 
sample of training data um, is usually the difference between um, a solvable problem and one that isn't. So again, in your problem, if you're thinking, I wonder if I can solve X with machine learning, try to think about how can I get a metric shit ton of data um, on my problem that's labeled data. And it has to be labeled data, which is to say that you have to know ahead of time um, what it is and what it isn't. So for example, if you're making a computer program that tells the difference between a hot dog and not a hot dog, mm -hmm. then it's not enough to have uh, lots and lots of pictures of hot dogs, you have to have lots and lots of pictures of hot dogs and to know ahead of time that they are hot dogs. Because mm -hmm. you have to tell the program that it's what it is, right? It's, just, it's not gonna just figure that out on its own. Um, or you can get your users to do it for you. This is a, a picture yeah. of reCAPTCHA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I'm sure you've filled out a lot of reCAPTCHAs in your day, and uh, you're basically just feeding a machine learning algorithm and you're helping train up uh, you know, a really impressive algorithm that can decide if you're a bot or not. And it's great because uh, you're just kind of running out your brain power and, and helping the, you know, the greater good of the internet pretty much um, with that. So yeah, if you can coerce your, or convince your users to perhaps uh, help you out, train your models and uh, label some data for you, all the better. So. Google's remarkably open about the reCAPTCHA thing too. I thought this was yeah. really surreptitious, but now it says it like right on their homepage. They're like, mm -hmm. you're feeding our machine learning algorithm, bro. Like that's that's what's happening here. Yeah. Uh, curiously, um, they actually do it really cleverly. Uh, in this picture here, that has a, a picture of a cat and says, um, "Select all the images that match this one below." And my brain immediately went to cats, and so I was like, "Well, these ones are cats, and these ones aren't." Um, I, I was showing this uh, to my wife ahead of this time, and she said, "Well, uh, everything except for the bottom left one." And I was like, "What? What are you talking about?" And she said, "Well, that's the only one that's not an animal." And I was like, "Oh, that's actually really clever." And then if you read the prompt, it doesn't say pick all the ones that are cats. Mm -hmm. It just says pick all the ones that are similar to this below. Mm -hmm. And so that way, they actually get a really big sample of uh, results from things that are just similar for whatever that means to you. Mm -hmm. And so they can get an idea of what things are similar to human beings without actually telling you the categories for what those mean. So that's actually really clever. Yeah, very smart. Um, so maybe at this point you're thinking like, so what? So you made some computer program that hacks into a web applications database, like mm -hmm. doesn't, they already have programs that do that. And that's true, um, but there's uh, part of what makes Deep Hack special and part of what uh, might make you want to make um, AI-based hacking tools in the past is there's nothing actually in what we were talking about that's specific to uh, the underlying database type. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, part of the entire thrust of this is that it's agnostic to the underlying database type, the structures and things like that. So in the previous example, we showed you um, exploiting a SQLite database because SQLite was easy. Um, um, here it is again using uh, Postgres. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, you can notice that the database type is, the, uh, is completely different. This, the query that it's making is totally different, um, but it works nonetheless. And this is the reason that AI is going to take off. This is the reason that um, this is going to be big and the reason that basically every major pen testing like tool, uh, certainly in 2018, but maybe in, even in 2017 is gonna start to add this. You're going to see web inspect and burp and basically everybody else adding machine learning um, to augment existing tooling because it can take care of this kind of fuzzy logic for you. You don't have to rewrite um, your tool to do any of this. And in fact, uh, the SQLite and uh, Postgres SQL um, uh, attacks here that we, should, that we just showed had exactly zero lines of code changed in them. So without changing a single line of code, you can train your uh, tool to do a completely different job, as in uh, completely different details, not mm -hmm. a completely different job. Yeah, and that generalized kind of, uh, you kind of have this infinitely flexible general you know, function, and that, that's gonna be super valuable for you know, tools going forward, not just injection attacks, but uh, a lot of other attacks, so. Yeah. That was demonstration. Mm. So um, some lessons learned. Um, it turns out that quality training data is really important. Um, mm. We uh, originally had a couple of ideas about how we were going to gather training data. Um, one of our first ideas was to just scrape the internet for SQL strings. Mm. And this actually works um, fairly well. You can just find uh, projects uh, open source on GitHub that have mm. Uh, SQL structures, and a tool can look at that and learn um, what SQL is, what sort of uh, structures of it are, what are the kind of uh, terms that it has. Um, but what it doesn't have a whole lot of our injection strings specifically, so we can teach our bot to speak SQL, but it doesn't know how to inject. And so in order to try to bridge that gap, we thought, well, hey, maybe we can just use uh, SQL map. Since uh, SQL map is another tool that you know does basically this. It turns out that SQL map um, generates strings that are just really fucking complicated. Um, yeah. It's in this uh, vein of tools that we refer to as uh, the worst best tools in that it's the, clearly the best tool at doing what it does. It mm -hmm. works really well, we use it on engagements, but at the same time it's just the worst. Mm -hmm. um, 
And the, the strings that it generates um, are just really complicated. The model had a really hard time picking up on it because it does things like uh, a yeah. binary um, search algorithm yeah, um, as that opposed was, to just character by character. Yeah, it was really hard for uh, the model to derive that binary search from, uh, from SQL map. So uh, we had to simplify it down and we basically made bad SQL map, which uh, does regular uh, Boolean search, uh, Boolean blind injection. Uh, it doesn't use binary search. It just kind of brute forces character by character. Um, so. Yeah, so training data, super, super important to get. Um, scraping the internet, becoming Google is, is pretty hard. Uh, they do a pretty good job of that. So uh, you want to try to get really good training data. And also you want to be incredibly careful about what you're rewarding. Uh, this is, it seems like kind of common sense, but um, it can really sneak up on you in really interesting ways. Uh, one, of our, one of our big problems uh, that we ran into, well, not like a big problem, but one of the funny things that kind of happened was uh, we didn't incentivize um, characters we had already found. And uh, we thought that, oh, well, we're rewarding, you know, characters found, we'll, we'll try this. We ran it for, you know, a long time. And uh, then we just found out our database or our tool is really good at just brute forcing the same character over and over again. So uh, we knew the table started with A really well. You know, that, that was, uh, we yeah. had that definitely locked down. Yeah, it was the bird getting a piece of seed every time it found a letter, right? So it got A, we gave yeah. it a reward. Got A again, it kept on giving a reward. Motherfucker kept on finding A. Um, yeah. Uh, so we're like, oh, okay, like, you will get more of whatever it is that you reward. And so you have to be really careful about that. You might think that you've described the problem accurately when, in fact, your computer has found some clever loophole in your own rules yeah. in order to just get an arbitrary amount of reward. Mm. Yeah, and uh, another thing we learned is uh, get a GPU, uh, or better yet, get a lot of them. Uh, we had a significant speed up from GPUs, and uh, there's a lot of uh, great companies out there that are you know, selling cheap GPUs, and uh, you can just rent them uh, on the cloud. It's like super easy, spin up, um, and it really helps. We had like a, something like a 20 times speed up when we were training our models. Um, so it's really easy to you know, kind of get started with this stuff, and then once you kind of get an idea for something you want to try, definitely get a GPU. Uh, it'll speed up your debug time. Uh, that was one of the frustrating things uh, kind of early. Um, it, you know, you have to train up your model every time you make a change. So you want to try to, uh, you know, make good changes. And then an hour later, you can find out if it was actually a good idea or not. So uh, You GPUs, thought compile times were bad. Yeah, it's like, you know, going back, yeah, massive C++. So yeah, the uh, getting GPUs, super helpful. Um, more the better, more the better. So some other considerations here about neural networks um, and uh, AI and hacking in general. Um, neural networks have this kind of inherent proprietariness to them um, in that uh, there's no really good way to debug them or to know what they're doing, like even really in principle. Your code, your logic, the thing that determines what your program is doing is a shape. It's a literal geometric shape, not figuratively, it's like actually a, it's a function, right, that has a shape. And so if you try to ask the question like, hey, why did my machine learning car just like run over a dog? The answer is fuck you, that's why. Like it, it did it because that's what it did it. Like it, there's no good reason for it, it just, it, yeah. It just followed the shape that it thought it was supposed to follow. And so uh, this is a problem both for, you know, like debugging purposes. In a former life, um, I was actually uh, responsible for like uh, writing test cases for um, uh, flight software. And we had um, extremely strict uh, what are called code coverage requirements, which is to say that the uh, I had to write test cases that hit every single line of code in the entire like suite of programs in order to like test that the whole thing wasn't just going to fall out of the sky. And we care about that sort of thing in terms of reliability of like critical safety um, environments. And I don't even know how, what does that even look like for an AI program? Like you can make a self-driving car that will on average be safer than a human being because you can make a, you know, a chess playing robot or a Go playing robot that's better than people. But can you have any strong assurances that it just won't go haywire? Like not really. Yeah. It doesn't even, I don't even know what that looks like in principle. Yeah, and who's responsible when it does go haywire, you know? I mean, so. This is yeah, aside from the entire liability issues. Right. Um, also, if you're the sort of person who cares about free and open source software, um, this should also sort of worry you in that the program behavior is not debuggable. It's not uh, reversible to any original form. Even if you're given the, the, the entire set of data that the person trained and the source code to it, you can't combine them to create the same program. It's just stochastic, which is to say, which is fancy math terms for random. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's also an inherent problem. So what does it even mean to have an open source AI program? Uh, we should start having a conversation about that. 
Yeah, um, you know, the big cloud providers, you know, Google, Facebook, all those big companies that do a lot of this kind of research, um, they will happily rent you out their spare CPU cycles and they will happily, you know, rent you out your GPUs, but they will never ever rent out their models and their uh, massive collections of data to you. That, you know, that's kind of the secret sauce, right? So uh, if all that is hidden, um, you know, you're kind of at a disadvantage if uh, you want to get started with this stuff. Uh, big hill to climb. Yeah, in a way that's not present with ordinary programs. There's a reason you see um, you know, all the major breakthroughs and this sort of thing coming from large companies that just coincidentally happen to have, have access to everyone's data. Because you need vast amounts of data in order to make these sorts of programs happen. Um, uh, if you, you know, want to tell the difference between a stop sign and a dog, then you really need to have lots and lots of pictures of stop signs and dogs. And if you, the average programmer, want to make a program that does that, uh, you just don't have that data. And the people who do aren't sharing. Um, uh, and more, uh, moreover, like programs, uh, AI writing, or writing an AI program is like incredibly fun. It's actually really rewarding and a lot easier than you probably think it is. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some great libraries out there like TensorFlow or actually Keras, which wraps that up into a, a very easy um, uh, sort of a higher level library. Um, but at the same time, it could be a really frustrating experience uh, because every once in a while the program will just do something that you didn't think you told it to do or it'll just like start going haywire and you have no idea why. And uh, you try to ask the question like, why did it do that? Is it because you didn't train it enough? Like that can always be a problem. Did you train it too much? Because that's a thing too. Uh, like it's just kind of really hard. Uh, there's also really fun problems like um, uh, what can best be described as, um, uh, uh, oh gosh. The, the, the forfeiting? Yeah, yeah. Well, you can forfeit data basically from the from the data to try to make it better. Basically, is where I'm getting at. Yeah. Mm. Um, so some future yeah. work here. Um, if you're like you know looking at making some uh, data that or some uh, programs that will you know exploit various things. I know we have some ideas about what we want to uh, take care of uh, mm. coming here in the near future, or things that we're actually already working on. Um, and here are some like good crunchy problems. Uh, as a good rule of thumb, there's a really prominent uh, researcher named uh, Andrew Wen who uh, uh, is responsible for a bunch of this stuff. Um, so as a good rule of thumb is like if a uh, human expert can solve the problem in like a couple of seconds, uh, then that's probably something that's eminently solvable by uh, a machine learning algorithm right now. And so if you think back into all of the things that you do in terms of uh, like your tasks as a pen tester or as a hacker or whatever, there's probably quite a bit in there that can be automated in terms of what is fuzzy logic that maybe you do as a human. That would be a really hard thing to um, uh, make a computer that would do that. Yeah, kind of hand program logic in there. Um, yeah, so uh, one thing that I'm really excited about is uh, password brute forcing um, because uh, when you're trying to you know, brute force some passwords, it it starts with uh, a word list and then you kind of, you know, hand jam some, uh, some rules to kind of mangle the word list. Uh, you know, if, if uh, you see, a, you know, the month of or the current season, you say, OK, well, I'll throw the end of the year, you know, the current year on there and maybe a bang at the end. Uh, those kinds of rules are definitely uh, just kind of uh, things you've you know, thought are a good idea and uh, they seem to fit a pattern uh, from the data. Well, a uh, machine learning algorithm would be really good at picking up on those patterns from, uh, you know, password dumps that have been dumped and uh, could potentially generate rules for you automatically. And uh, they might be better than the ones you can think of, you know, yourself. Uh, they might be able to see things and see patterns and uh, have relationships that you wouldn't really be able to see. Yeah, in fact, that's something that we frequently do on engagements when mm -hmm. we uh, are cracking passwords that we've, you know, dumped from whatever. Um, we'll frequently get a little ways in, look at the passwords that we've already brute forced, and then try to kind of manually sift it for patterns. Like maybe the first character is always capital and the last letter is always a number, or perhaps it follows some like company pattern, or uh, if you have an organization like everybody else's that uh, expires passwords every quarter, then they tend to have things like spring 2016, fall 2017 as mm -hmm. passwords. Uh, and so the, uh, if you had a machine learning algorithm that could automatically pick up on these patterns, that would be a really good addition to existing path force, uh, uh, password brute forcing um, mm -hmm. the methodology. In addition yeah. um, to that, we have things like an instrumented web app fuzzer, something that's given the internal structures from an instrumented uh, Python web, uh, web application, can see the internal data structures and logic, and can try to produce inputs that will exercise as much of that. Basically like um, AFL, if you're familiar with that, um, but basically uh, potentially much smarter in that it uses a neural network, but also um, mm -hmm. for a web application. That's a you know, much um, larger set of um, sorts of things to attack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, 
like I was saying before, um, there's a there's a lot of hype about this kind of stuff. Uh, there's you know tons of media coverage about it. You know, it's in Hollywood and all kinds of stuff. All these you know AI programs. But uh, what it's actually kind of bad at is uh, discovering like a new class of vulnerability, right? Um, so it, it's not. Uh, AI isn't really going to, at least in the you know short term, it's not going to uh, be able to discover new types of vulnerabilities. You know, it's not going to, it's not probably not going to be able to find uh, some kind of new crazy, you know, injection flaw that we just don't, you know, know about. Um, and a lot of that comes down to uh, context, especially you know uh, with security testing. Um, context is pretty key around some uh, application behavior and functionality. Uh, sometimes it's it's totally all right to be able to run remote commands on a you know machine because that's you know the tool's purpose. Uh, the machine learning algorithm doesn't know that, so it doesn't really have the context to decide what is a security risk and what is not. Yes. So, suppose you uh, make a request and a social security number comes back, mm -hmm. like. Is that a bug? Is that, is that intended behavior? It might actually be a legitimate website that's supposed to do that. Mm -hmm. How is the computer supposed to know whether that's a bug or not? I mean, this is kind of a more fundamental question about like what is a security bug, right? Mm -hmm. Reasonable people can disagree sometimes on this fact. And moreover, the computer is missing context. So imagine teaching a computer or yourself, in fact, learning a whole new language entirely on the basis of dictionaries. So you read a whole dictionary, you read a thesaurus, you can read all as much the structure and syntax of a particular language as you want, right? Say French. Um, and then you go to France and try to talk to people and you'd be completely shit out of luck. Somebody's going to tell you some sort of idioms, say like, you know, take a hike or something like that. And you have no idea what that means in context because the uh, language is about more than just the words on paper or words as they're spoken. It's a part of culture. And so the same thing is true of security in general, that what is and is not a security general uh, problem often just depends. And so uh, I suspect that machine learning algorithms are going to be quite bad at doing this sort of thing and quite good at automating tasks that used to be fuzzy logic that um, computers um, previously quite bad at. And I think that's a very large space in computer security um, that could be taken advantage of. Yeah, unfortunately no Skynet right now. Um, but yeah. Um, that's it. We'll, uh, we have a couple minutes for questions if anybody wants them. Mm -hmm.